So we're following on straight from the previous video where we looked at the CPU and a bit of memory too. So we're sort of covering uh, the hardware, uh, more typical part of this topic. So uh, we covered the bits in green last video and memory too, and we're covering the rest in this video. So let's begin by looking at kind of an overview. So hardware uh, really is just for physical items that make up a computer system. So um, it talks about functions. So here's a list of components. It, it, uh, has written on the specification. So the first one is a processor. As we've said, the function of this is to carry out, uh, as in execute, the instructions from programs uh, and its, uh, I guess, purpose, you'd say, is processing data. And so main memory uh, temporarily stores the data and programs, program instructions for open applications. We said that uh, when you open a program, uh, data is loaded from the secondary storage into the main memory uh, because of uh, main memory is a lot faster. As for secondary storage is our large persistent store of data, we're looking at three different technologies in this video um, a bit later, and so this is our large capacity memory. And then we have our input devices, uh, it's slightly difficult to, uh, so a function really is just introducing data to the system and then uh, output devices present the data that's been processed. So this is what a processor looks like if you, um, you won't be able to see it like this on a computer because it'll be covered by a large heat sink hopefully. Um, the main memory looks a bit like this, you have these sticks of RAM plugged into your motherboard. Um, doesn't really list, doesn't mention knowing, having to know about the motherboard which is obviously quite a key bit of hardware um, but it's not listed on the specification so I'm not going to cover it, I don't want to cover extra stuff. Um, so this is what RAM looks a bit like. Uh, secondary storage, this is a hard drive, this is one technology, um, magnetic technology, uh, we'll look at it a bit later. Um, and so one thing I didn't talk about in the last video, we talked about memory, but I didn't talk about volatility too much. And again, the key term volatile, um, whether you need to know or not is uh, difficult to ascertain, but it helps explain it anyway. And it's, well, you might not know that memory, um, the main memory, so RAM, the data is lost when the power is turned off and we call it a volatile memory. That's kind of a key term. And so when you shut your computer down, when the power is turned off, you lose the data stored in RAM. So if you haven't saved um, your Word document, your essay, uh, your presentation, and it hasn't been saved automatically as a background process, uh, then when you turn your computer off, it'll be lost because that data has been stored in the RAM and it's wiped when the power is turned off. You need the power to sustain uh, the storage. Whereas a hard disk, uh, fortunately, when you turn your computer off, you still get your files when you turn it back on again. So it's non-volatile storage. Um, so um, we looked at other technologies, so like cache, cache is volatile, uh, whereas ROM is non-volatile. Um, so if we talk about an example, often exam questions at GCC level are like, you know, they give you a device and ask you to list some input, output, um, and storage devices. So for a phone, um, f uh, there's lots of different ones to talk about, but um, an obvious one would be a speaker as an output. Then you might have, in terms of storage, you have uh, a SIM card plugged in here, then you have or sort of a memory card, I don't know exactly uh, what most phones use, um, but we'll have some kind of storage Im uh, embedded within the phone. Um, you also have, so this is uh, an iPhone which has a fingerprint scanner, other phones have it too, and also the button counts as input because you're introducing some data, it might not seem like data, but it's still causing an effect. Uh, also a camera would be an input, and a touch screen, you have got to be a little bit careful, that's why I've underlined touch, because the screen on its own is an output device, but when you have a touch screen as well, it can be both an input and output device, but it's the touch element that's the actual input, hence why it's underlined. So now we need to look at the three technologies for secondary storage. So as we say, these are persistent stores of data. Uh, persistent being that they sort of just exist. Uh, that's basically saying non-volatile. Uh, they're not directly connected to the CPU, whereas main memory has these bus. These I think the plural will be buses uh, connected to the CPU. Um, the secondary storage has to go through other channels, uh, the input output channels too. Uh, sorry, instead. Uh, so the first thing I'm doing to look at is magnetic uh, storage. And so these devices use read and write heads that contain electromagnets. So electromagnets, um, actually, we won't really, <laughs> let's not define electromagnets right now, this isn't physics. Uh, so a small part of the storage surface is either magnetized, and when it's magnetized, it's represented by, it's representing one in binary, or demagnetized representing zero, and the heads uh, control with some read what state for in. So uh, an old form we don't really use anymore is for cassette, which would be a magnetic storage device, but mainly we talk about um, hard disks or hard drives. So this is kind of a diagram of actually the hard disk. And so this is our what we mean by a read write head. So this um, sort of, this axis arm stays in position, and the disk spins, and we have these sectors, and 
the surface will be littered by uh, these demagnetized and magnetized bits, uh, which represent one and zero. So, um, yeah, uh, this is what it actually looks like as an actual component. Uh, this is kind of um, uh, so I guess the key bit to say is that this is constantly moving and so you have this actual physical disk spinning and it's quite noisy um, and uh, it's actually this mechanical component. Um, a second one is uh, optical storage and so CDs, DVDs etc and on these disks uh, the binary data is stored as variations of height so instead of being either magnetized or demagnetized these are actual variations of height so when we talk about burning a disk you know it's, ch it's uh, uh, causing these indents and so um, when light is shined from an optical drive uh, the light that hits one of these pits um, like a dent uh, reflects differently to a land which is just for flat bits and so the, de the device the drive can detect the differences and then read the data based on this so as I say the data is written with the laser burning the pits into uh, the storage medium so this is kind of what it looks like if we have our, our land here our flat spots uh, light is shined from the optical drive and it reflects straight back so it can tell that's going to be uh, a one probably. Um, whereas if we have a dent here, uh, done quite badly, light comes in and it might reflect out uh, differently and so it doesn't receive it back, it knows there's um, a pit there. Um, the third one, if I can get my animation sorted, uh, is solid state technology and this is a form of flash memory uh, but it's non-mechanical so unlike this having a disc spinning, this is spinning as well when you put a CD it's really noisy when you put a CD in or a DVD um, and so there are no moving parts, parts in solid state. Solid state is a lot more, if you thought these were kind of complicated, solid state is a lot more complicated um, because they're really just circuits with uh, the logic circuits, uh, that's actually the next topic, uh, which just retain data um, which you can change so uh, it's kind of your conventional um, secondary storage and this is what an SSD uh, solid state drive looks a bit like. Right, so just to preempt any possible exam questions, um, just a few more points. So with magne magnetic storage, usually we have a large capacity. I mainly talk about hard disks here, not really cassettes, and they're cheap to buy. So in terms of cost per bit or cost per megabyte, uh, they're quite cheap to buy. And they're usually quite reliable, but not very durable. They're not totally reliable, um, but they're not durable because this can be broken very easily. If you drop your hard drive, it'll I mean, there's no really re no real reason you would, but if you dropped it, it would break and you wouldn't be able to use it again. Um, and they're not very portable. You can have um, portable hard disks um, or hard drives, um, but generally they're a bit awkward to carry around. Whereas a CD um, is quite good for, for being portable. It's quite easy to transport and carry. Um, but per unit, they have quite a small capacity, um, like less than one gigabyte. These could be uh, multiple terabytes. Um, and they're quite reliable and durable but can be very easily damaged. So a bit like uh, magnetic, they are kind of protected by a case, uh, but CDs can be scratched, everyone's uh, come across that problem at some point. Uh, a solid state uh, is very fast for storage, so they have quick read write time, still not in the same league as RAM, uh, but it's the same kind of technology. Um, but it's very expensive, so um, you know this is only 128 gigabytes if you can see it uh, here, um, that would be quite a lot, be uh, probably a lot more than maybe a couple of, you know, maybe a couple of terabytes of a hard disk. Um, and they are very reliable because they're non-mechanical, they're quiet, they use little power um, and they generally have a smaller capacity than magnetic, at least for the same cost. So uh, that may help if you have any exam questions on these technologies. The final thing to talk about is microcontrollers. And so a micro microcontroller is a small computer contained on a single chip. Um, and so this is uh, a picture I found, I'm assuming this is a microcontroller, it's slightly, slightly difficult to tell, but it's contained on one uh, chip. Uh, so it's difficult to tell what each of these things are, so I'm not going to really attempt it. Um, and so this is what my more, steric, my kind of in my mind, a microcontroller looks like, but this is slightly more interesting. So um, like any normal computer, or just any computer in general, they have a CPU, so something to execute the instructions, and they have a small amount of RAM, uh, we talked about the, pro, uh, the stored program concept in the last video, they need that main memory, and we also have input output devices or peripherals, and so we've got a port here, uh, so we can, uh, well, it'd be, probably be sensors too. And so, it, uh, sometimes they can be programmed using, uh, uh, with so, so they'll have some ROM somewhere, read only memory, and they might have some, uh, might have a translator on, stored on that ROM, usually an interpreter, 
because it's quite flexible for this purpose and they can be programmed um, using that translator and so you can kind of control it but usually they're very fixed purposes in devices and so as I say uh, uh, usually uh, they exist in lots of everyday devices called embedded devices where um, they kind of have this very uh, single purpose and so they can control devices and they you know like a remote will have a microcontroller in especially um, uh, like a, a relatively advanced remote to say it, I guess like that and like quite an expensive oven will have you know has the, the display and certain other features will have a microcontroller uh, controlling this and like uh, a uh, car key. Uh, I don't know if the controller would be actually in the car key, but it would probably be sort of in the car at least uh, when it's being received. Um, so there are in everyday de uh, everyday devices, but generally, as the more expensive your devices go, uh, the more there'll be a microcontroller in them. And so, also talks about something called an ac actuator. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, I don't really know. Um, and this is a motor that can move or control a system. And this isn't a very good picture of a motor. I'm sure you know what a motor is, this bit just spins. Um, and so it also talks about a sensor. And so what a sensor does, uh, a, a motor is just changing, electric, so it's converting electrical power into movement. Um, and a sensor is kind of detecting changes to the environment and converts it into electricity, um, into an output or a signal. And so, you know, you have sensors that detect acceleration, called an accelerometer, uh, light intensity and altitude, which is barometer, also things like um, pressure, etc. Uh, so that's about it for this topic. Um, a lot easier compared to the last one. Uh, so thank you for watching.